Welcome everyone to another episode of the Marketing Measurement Matters podcast. And I'm delighted to have Anna Carrera Vidal with us today. Hi, Anna, how are you doing? Hi, I'm doing very well. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's great to have you here and it's a pleasure to uh, be talk able to talk about the playbook that you've created. So Anna is a um, marketing measurement specialist at Google and has been working on this topic uh, for a long while. But uh, we let Anna guide us to, you know, how she came up to be a marketing measurement specialist at Google. But it's also very important to explain uh, what we really like about the playbook. I think it's arguably one of the most important, uh, how should we call it, ebook, white paper, summary of best practices on how, how to actually do marketing measurement nowadays. And of course, it's uh, also very important because it has been published by Google. Uh, I think one of the most important ad tech or ad platforms and uh, businesses out there. Um, but for the start, and also we have Tim Kleinkamp also with us. Hi, Tim, how are you doing? I'm good. Thanks. How are you? Yeah, good, good. I envy Tim Beagles a bit. He's on the way to the Hurricane Festival and cannot make it. He always has better stuff to do uh, than to talk with us, apparently. But he's really sad that he missed out on this one, but his hurry Hurricane tickets were already booked. So, um, but yeah, let's get back to the to the playbook and, and uh, to you, Anna. Um, again, uh, really great to have you here on the show and that you could make it on this uh, sort of short notice. I think we had our discussion just last week, our pre-call, yeah. right? Yeah, great. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Um, cool. So yeah, I can uh, I can explain a bit uh, about myself. So yeah, actually, I started my journey uh, on yeah. How did I ended up here? It's a bit uh, uh, not sort of the classic one because I started on advertising and communication. So on the more um, yeah, just communication sides of it. I worked on it for a while and I decided it wasn't for me because, uh, you know, I couldn't deal with things that weren't as black and white as, as numbers. I I thought numbers would be black and white. So that, that's what got me more to the measurement side. Um, and after my master's, I started at booking.com uh, where I had the, uh, yeah, the, the chance to learn about incrementality really from, from the start. Um, but then I was thinking already, why is you know, like uh, uh, not everyone doing this. This seems like the most logical uh, thing to do. Um, I worked on incrementality for display, for YouTube, um, and uh, uh, different sorts of uh, A-B experiments. Uh, yeah, all the things you can imagine for about four years. And afterwards, I uh, uh, saw the opportunity to move to Google, and I thought that would be uh, uh, also very nice to see how others are doing it. Um, I've been doing, uh, yeah, consultation on, on incrementality for Google for the past uh, uh, five years. So yeah, let's say I live and breathe incrementality. Uh, but one change that, that I also started noticing for about like two years ago, um, once it sort of started going out of its shelf, incrementality, uh, uh, what I realized is if I talk to a client about incrementality, it's never only about incrementality. It's about incrementality in comparison to what else they are doing at the moment. Um, so that's why uh, we also started expanding uh, the, the focus of the role to not only uh, incrementality, but also uh, MMM, attribution and, and brand measurement. So within my team, we have amazing uh, expertise, uh, also deep dive on MMM, deep dive on, on brand measurement. But right now, all of us uh, cover everything because, again, you, you, it's not feasible to have uh, three different people talking to the same client and, you know, like all of them are important. So that's been also a bit of the evolution on the role that, you know, reflects a bit the evolution that we are seeing as well yeah. in, the, in the market. Yeah, I was just going to say that it seems to be reflective of what is happening in the market anyhow, that, you know, these things sort of come together. Maybe just uh, to, to, to because, you you know, we have a chance to understand what Booking was doing with you here. Um, so when you talk about incrementality at, um, you know, understand or understanding incrementality of different marketing channels at Booking, was it also mainly based on incrementality tests and uh, what was your day-to-day -day task there? Yeah, um, so incrementality is uh, at the North start metric for booking if it's not incremental uh, they're not investing on it uh, as far as i know that also remains uh, uh, today their uh, their mantra 
Um, so back in the day, what I uh, uh, was doing was actually um, a charity PSA type of uh, A-B experiments where, you know, like one part of the group would see the PSA ad, the other part would see the, the booking ads. Um, in my day to day, I was literally just writing the script that would pull the data, do the statistical analysis, and then come up with recommendations on like, hey, this is what we saw in the campaign, sit down with the channel owner and see which ways we could optimize. Um, so it would be kind of a full circle. On the one hand, we would um, yeah, just look at, hey, what are the optimization levers that we believe are uh, likely to improve the campaigns and then do ongoing incrementality tests to confirm that actually we were improving the incrementality or maintaining the incrementality uh, for that channel. So I have, I have one question already, uh, Anna, since at the beginning of your career, you started asking yourself, um, uh, why isn't everyone doing this? Uh, and that's something also I ask myself sometimes, but obviously I have an opinion about it. And I think you were probably also have a found, have found a few reasons why not everyone's doing that, right? So why do you believe that's the case actually? Yeah, um, so I've come up with the uh, conclusion that it's uh, uh, quite a, it has different angles uh, uh, to the uh, to the answer. Um, on the one hand is about skills and, and knowledge. Like we do really see that there is a, um, yeah, lack of understanding of what incrementality is bringing to the table and a lack of understanding at even uh, the, the C-level suite, right? Like if, you're, if your CFO has been seeing attribution all their life and, you know, like that's what they know, that's what the, uh, they've been reading for the past uh, 20 years and we come to the table with an incrementality result, it's like, what is this number? I don't know what to do with, the, with this number and I only have it for this channel or this campaign, uh, you know, like how does this compare with the rest? Um, it's sort of like a bit of a chat, like a, yeah, two worlds crashing and uh, uh, yeah, lack of direct actionability on, on, the, on that. Um, so there's the part on, on skills. Uh, and then there's the part even on uh, um, tools and skills on running the, the test itself. So the, there is a reality that still incrementality, um, it's based on yeah, statistical analysis and a statistical analysis can only be run when you have enough volume uh, uh, and you have certain characteristics on your um, company to give that volume. So for example, it needs to be um, purchase cycles that are relatively uh, short. Uh, you need to also have that volume. Um, if you don't meet those requirements, it is still sometimes even if you bought into the concept of incrementality to run a test becomes very hard. So either you do a very big test and then it's like, okay, I'm meeting these people that are a bit skeptical and I'm asking them that they turn off 50% of uh, uh, of investment because that's the only way that I have something feasible. It's a hard sell. So, you know, that I think it's yeah, a bit like you need to yeah, have also without knowing the outcome like it could very well be that the outcome is well we don't really know still <laughs> and exactly. that's the thing yeah. like you, you're yeah. not guaranteed to prove anything um yeah. and i think that makes it so hard to convince uh yeah i mean th this kind of answers two questions that we already um, had in our uh, sort of document here so mm -hmm. what, what was what, one of the motivations to create this playbook to educate the market a bit better about the possibilities of also incrementality tests and how to tie that into the rest of the measurement stack. And then um, how do you, yeah, how do you actually then convince your, the brands and clients that you work with to do, um, to do tests, but maybe let's start with the first one. What was the, what, what was the uh, motivation for, for you to write up this playbook? Yeah. So yeah, we, we have this program at Google where you have a, a like, the chance to work for six months in a in a different role uh, and then just come back to your previous role. So this is like quite amazing. So I had the chance to work in the go-to-market team and uh, uh, over there focus on media effectiveness. And uh, the goal of those six months was indeed try to see like, hey, how can we uh, make sure that uh, conversations about media effectiveness are easier 
for you know like for specialists to have but also how can we bring across these concepts that are rather complex how can we bring them in an in an easier way um so the the main motivation was indeed to educate the market like hey can we give tools to uh, uh to our advertisers to uh, uh everyone that's working on this topic can we give them tools to actually um do this on a better way um and uh of course you know like our mission is organize the information make it accessible and useful so you know like that that's also part of of what we are trying to do on on media effectiveness measurement so if we can uh, like we truly believe if we can get people to measure better they will also uh invest better right so um yeah like advancing the market is a is a win-win also and, and how, how was it um, received, the playbook? I mean, we, we obviously have our opinion about it and LinkedIn was full of it. And um, but, but obviously, that's not everything that counts. How, how did your clients and uh, the rest of the world kind of saw that you brought up this playbook? Yeah, so we've got a lot of uh, a positive response uh, uh, for sure, right? Like uh, um, one of the parts that I uh, um, get most positive feedback on is on the... Uh, actionability of it, which is something that, that we were lacking a lot in this area. It's like, hey, theoretically, it makes sense. But then when I try to do it, I don't even know where to start. So the fact that it even gives just some pointers, um, that, that's, uh, uh, that's been one of the, of the um, kind of most positive uh, reactions. Um, what we do see is that even if it gets more practical, it's still hard to digest right and and we knew it when like when i was writing it i was like wow there's like no way that we can capture really everything and one of the learnings was it is an area where where it is very hard to give one single advice that works for everyone like there there is uh not something that, that we can extrapolate and say you know like nine out of ten companies they do this and you know like they see an increase of on 10% on the effectiveness of, of the campaigns. It's, it's just impossible to do because there's so much nuance. Um, so it really was trying to find a balance between, hey, how do we give a framework that people can use and how can we get people to start thinking about it? Uh, but indeed, there's a, a long road after you've read the playbook until you actually can can implement it. And it really is like sitting down and, and having those conversations that, that still need to uh, happen afterwards so we're using it a lot as a conversation starter you know like sharing it with uh, uh yeah with our advertisers and our partners and just see hey make a plan right like this should really be the the foundation to make a plan to, to go uh and and put it in practice so do you actually also think it makes like your life easier in terms of the the effort you have to put in educating, maintaining client relationships, or does it even raise more questions than uh, than it solves? So we we are always thinking of like we also publish a lot of content, right? And we are always thinking like, all right, okay, we we actually would want this content to also lighten the load of our CSM and and solutions engineering team a bit, but that sometimes works, but then sometimes it's also like, oh yeah. I have a specific, very specific question about this very particular sentence. Um, I'd say it depends on the journey where we are, like at the stage of the journey where we are with the, um, yeah, with the appetizer. Um, a lot of times it helps open up the mindset on the scope of things that, that we can help with and that, that we can talk about. Um, it's a, uh, it's more of a pre-read, right? And and it's also um, something that we can send whenever uh, I cannot help directly, right? Because there's also a limited amount of uh, uh, yeah media effectiveness specialist, and uh, there's a limited amount of clients that, that we can work directly with. So it is also something that that can be used to offer some some knowledge to uh, uh, other clients where we cannot speak directly. So um specific questions yes but it's mostly used to like open up and and give more of a breadth of idea on like hey these are all the things that actually media effectiveness means that's what i find a lot of times is that a lot, it's not even 
in uh, uh, like step number one on like, hey, these things come together and you actually should have a framework that looks at them together. That's step number one that, that doesn't always happen. Like seeing it in silos, it's not a, a, a weird uh, a situation. Yeah, I th so what, what impressed me when I first went through, so to be very honest, the very first time I saw this title and you know downloaded the PDF, I was like, okay, this is one of the, it makes sense and let's see what it, you know, what it's all about. But I thought it's more like marketing material even and then talk to a specialist. But I was really impressed by the practical um, guidance there and the showing the best practices. So, you know, how to use MMM multipliers for um, optimizing your MTA and, and really, really practical down to a step-by-step -step guide almost. And I think it's, it's amazing on the one side to kind of show what, you know, what are the possibilities, what are the opportunities. But I could also imagine someone who's still... An, to truth to be told, we see that as well, uh, brands that still are based on last click attribution and, you know, that don't know how to evaluate offline or mentality actually. And I could imagine that for them, it might be a bit over, like, you know, could be overwhelming if they think, oh, now I need to do all of this at once. Um, I mean, you have this practical guide on how to actually implement it. But um, it, it's it's such a I think such a good yeah, playbook as it says uh, for you know how to get where you could potentially be and, and derive all the value from uh, media effectiveness so uh, measurement and and um, that's why I think it's so valuable um, not not as a necessarily okay uh, now do this if you're there um, and but also showing all the practical implications and uh, practical examples because. You know, we talk a lot about triangulation and holistic marketing measurement and la la la. And sounds it sounds very quickly. It sounds like a, just another marketing buzzword um, to sell sell a solution. I even saw one uh, expert, or I think, was from another vendor, uh, publicly proclaiming on LinkedIn, "I hate triangulation," and uh, you know, <laughs> and, and saying like every method has its place and you shouldn't combine them and la la la. And I was like, well, you know, they should probably read Anna's playbook and like come up with a different opinion on it. Um, because yeah, it, it quickly sounds like a, a you know holy grail to do triangulation and have this one KPI that tells you everything for for each channel. Mm -hmm. um, but if you follow the advice, uh, if one follows the advice that you give in the book, you actually understand. Okay, there's actually more to it than just the marketing buzzword and bringing these yeah. methodologies together. Yeah, and and for sure, like what what I found. So uh, maybe also a bit of background on how the playbook was written. Um, I did do interviews with uh, sort of Inimia, which were the clients that were actually already doing this in, in one shape or form. And uh, um, like I said, I encountered that each of them did it differently. So the, the thing also is that triangulation, mother measurement, uh, trifecta, whatever, like all the different words that I used to, to call it. Um, it's sort of an umbrella term that is implemented differently by different uh, uh, companies and, and by different partners. Um, so the use case on trying to find one single truth, I actually point that out on the playbook. Uh, that's one that we discourage because there is no, like that's a utopia that it's very hard to get to. What we, uh, uh, what we recommend is that you use each of them for what each of them is best for. So we, you want to have a framework where you have a clear, uh, idea on what you are using each method, like which question is each method answering for, and uh, make sure that the question that you're answering with that method is actually aligned. So again, if you have this day-to-day -day optimization, hey, attribution is still going to be best. But of course, if you're going to try to do your yearly budgets only with attribution, well, you know, that that's likely not going to be your best methodology. So it's not about like, hey, we try to get one number and we want to get that number uh, working for the CMO and working for the channel owner. Like that's just utopia and it's not gonna, uh, yeah, it's never yeah. gonna be the best yeah. number then. Yeah. Um, Maybe also, um, so, I mean, obviously you might be a, like the sample that you have might not be completely representative since they are probably a bit more advanced than, you know, everyone else uh, on, on average, right? But how many just, as a rough estimate, how many in, in terms of percentages of your of the companies you you are observing already have everything in place and are 
operationalizing that successfully, like 10% or like, and with everything, I mean, regular testing, I would say at least a quarterly MMM and then MTA ongoing on a daily basis. How many, how many clients have that actually implemented? Very little. <laughs> so indeed, I, I think if you think of 5%, um, you'd be thinking of a good number. Yeah. And, and, and then, I think that's actually maybe good to hear. So everyone who's listening can listen up. Uh, so that, that people also, um, you know, set realistic expectations and also don't, um, you know, don't beat themselves over, uh, up over not being as far already. Because if you go on LinkedIn, it seems like everyone has that, right? Mm -hmm. It seems like your mom and pop, um, you know, hardware shop next door has a sophisticated triangulation um, procedure already in place since um, 2021, right? But that's actually not the case. And it is a journey. And, uh, and I think the playbook is good to get started or get along on that journey. Yeah, exactly. And and um, one of the things that, that uh, I also mentioned is uh, uh, some different stages of, of maturity. Um, it is unrealistic to think, hey, if I'm using last click attribution, uh, by the end of the year, I'll be using triangulation. I would be very impressed if, uh, uh, you know, like if that's the case. Um, of course, it, it will depend on, like I said, it's very nuanced. So you need to decide what's the, the next uh, uh, the next methodology that, that you're going to onboard on the, uh, um, on the company. Uh, but I'd always say start one by one. You know, like look at your use cases. What are the gaps that you're actually uh, uh, seeing um, that need to be filled most uh, dramatically? Uh, and then choose, hey, am I going to start with incrementality? Am I going to start with MMM? And then just look at them side by side, you know, like start having this framework, this cadence, and then evolve from there. But that's, that's this big uh, piece of education that, that they mentioned at the start, right? So the the culture mindset needs to change. Otherwise, it's numbers being flown and that, that's not going to uh, have the impact. Right, like that's still gonna be yeah. only on a practitioner level, and not really change the way that the whole, um, yeah, investment on on marketing is uh, um, uh, done. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I, yeah. Oh, sorry. No, I I wanted to ask the question back, right? Because I presume that you have the same conversations uh, uh, with your clients, and like I said, if I reflect on the ones I have, maybe it's eighty percent education, twenty percent actually doing uh, uh, something. Would you uh, like, yeah, what, what is your experience and where do you find the, the biggest yeah, time spent? Or heard? Maybe I can, I can start on that one. So I'm the chief data scientist and for my work that actually holds true what you're saying. So it's probably like 80% talking to people, educating them externally, but also internally um, and 20% and actually like building things. So that's definitely true. Um, now, for us, there's two, um, in terms of operationalization, is, I mean, two things to it, right? So if we onboard the client, uh, I mean, if we sign a contract and then we, you know, successfully finish the implementation after a couple of months, then we could say, all right, that client is doing triangulation because they have a tool for it. They're paying for it. They might be using it even. Um, so, so that is up, that is a higher share than than um, than five percent, obviously, right? Um, but for us, um, for us, it's a bit. So for you, it's probably it's probably like MTA testing for marketing image modeling, I guess. For us, it's the other way around um, because with MTA, that's what we started with back in twenty fifteen, and it's you know it's relatively easy to onboard. You just pull the data from GA four from our own tracking, Adobe, whatever. And then like after three days or so, the data is in the dashboard's fine. Um, marketing mix modeling, as we all know, takes a bit longer to onboard, um, to model and stuff, but it also works on historical data. So ex exposed data is, is fine for it. Now for incrementality testing, the client actually needs to get active themselves and make active, um, you know, split the user base, whether it's a geo test or maybe you can still do an A-B test. Uh, you know, in, in any case, you need to get some variation, some randomness into your user base. Usually that's a geo test these days. Uh, and then you need to vary your budget. So there's a whole lot of convincing 
that needs to go into this. And our like process point varied who we talk to. Um, so often it's like a head of marketing. Um, sometimes it's a CMO. Sometimes it's also the uh, person responsible for a specific channel. And then, uh, you know, that might be a bit more difficult even to get that uh, escalated into the person uh, who, is, um, who is making these budget decisions that are uh, necessary to do it in quality testing. So for us, incrementality testing is the last step. Mm. Um, I, I would say due to operational, but also um, organizational reasons uh, on, the, on the client side. And to get all of that um, up and running, um, that is, yeah, I would say we'd also be in the 5% range um, there. Um, so yeah, that's uh, the, the, the holy grail, obviously, but um, it's, it, it's a journey. And what is for us important though, is that people are able to make um, still reap some benefits on the journey, that they yeah. do not make decisions Oh, yeah. they have everything and it's validated by 10 that is key. yeah that is one of the most important thing that they don't wait till the end of the year to you know drive some actions from it and actually change budgets and etc um that they, they actually start acting on the insights that they have because they have to keep in mind before that they were just using last click and still acted on the data so you know and obviously last click has all the problems that it has that we all know about but maybe one more question be, uh, that I'd be interested in: How how do you what 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 do you see? Like, where do brands usually, um, where where they where are they usually on the sort of maturity stage? And what maturity stages do you see in terms of measurement? Is it do do they already done some incrementality test? And you know, um, I mean, with booking, we kind of learned about it, and I think they're probably also one of the most sophisticated companies in that regard. Um, but what from your work do you see usually? Is it they have some MTA in place? Maybe Google's data driven attribution have driven some, um, yeah, some understanding from the marketing mix about that. Uh, through that, did they start with some MMM, either through Robin or Lightweight? Uh, what, what is most common? Mm -hmm. um, so we see quite some difference depending on the type of client. So if you mm -hmm. think of your uh, more traditional clients, uh, CPG clients, those are all clients that, that always have done MMM. They still have MMM. Uh, maybe attribution didn't even make sense for them. So they like that, that's a bit of like a different uh, uh, type of clients. If we think more of your classic performance e-commerce client that, that's been very attribution heavy, which I think it's a lot of the ones that people on LinkedIn always talk about because it's like attribution doesn't work well. You, you need to have a, a, a business where at, you can actually attribute things and, and track them. Um, so on those cases, um, I like we do see some incrementality here and there, like that, that you know, like that's done for uh, some channels that maybe allow it because the platform allows it, um, but they're like more sporadic. And uh, um, we are seeing more and more MMMs being being uh, developed there. So it was more like before it was incrementality was sort of the go to methodology to complement. And let's say in the past two years, uh, these have been a lot of clients that have uh, jumped in the MMM train when they've seen like, hey, tracking is actually uh, uh, becoming harder and harder and MMM can be uh, the answer. Uh, for this. Um, and by the way, uh, lightweight MMM was sort of the old version that uh, we had where we launched Meridian uh, recently. Um, and that's going to be the, the open source uh, MMM uh, go to for for Google. Uh, it's still on, uh, yeah, only limited spots available. By the yeah, end. we know, we know. If you have any means to make it available to us, then uh, please do so. <laughs> <laughs> we would love to check it out. It is, uh, uh, yeah, it, it has a lot of, uh, um, yeah, I'd say it's lightweight 10 times better than uh, like uh, Meridian is 10 times better. But I'll, uh, yeah, I can see, we, we can see offline. Okay, I, uh, great. Yeah. I don't promise. Well, I don't want to <laughs> create any pressure here, but yeah. Yeah, no, exactly. But um yeah, I'd say a bit of both. It also depends on the amount of uh, budget, data science, resources, uh, what comes first, right? Like somebody that has the skills and it's eager can, but doesn't have maybe the budget 
can do quicker and incrementality tests than investing on developing the MMM, right? Like it's still more expensive in terms of investment uh, that needs to be done creating an MMM than running incrementality. Yeah. Uh, incrementality is more about convincing the stakeholders to uh, actually take a, a step at changing the business as usual uh, to get some learnings. Yeah. Um, I think we managed to get all our questions asked. I don't know if you have any further questions. You said you had, had some questions. I don't know if you have more, but uh, happy to also answer those. I, I do. I, I was just wondering, because you asked me like, hey, how do you get people to uh, be interested on incrementality, right? And I, I, I wanted to send the, the question back to you um, to also hear like, what is... Uh, um, yeah, usually your reasoning to explain that they should be doing incrementality. Well, um, one, one reason is that if they uh, want to start and exploring a completely new channel that we try to tell them, look, it's, uh, you know, we need historic data to analyze it properly with MMM or MPA. So why not think about doing it in a sort of, you know, instead of, for example, if they want to try a TikTok or whatever, uh, why do it everywhere that they could at once? Um, rather design a test together with us where we are also happy to support them with. And I think it's it's many times it's not that they actually don't want to do it. They just don't know necessarily how to do it properly. So they're also keen to explore new things. I think that's one of the most important uh, aspects of being a marketing manager to see new opportunities and new channels and new marketing activities. Mm -hmm. um, so th that is one way. And then obviously we tell them we like to be challenged on the results that we put up because we all know MMM has a small data problem. MTA can help with that, but ideally you do incrementality tests to validate. Mm -hmm. And that's where we also see some, um, some, you know, some good motivation for, for brands that are understanding this whole concept of you know, MTA, MMM being more on the correlational side of things to get to mm -hmm. causality. But incrementality tests are uh, much better suited to actually prove causality um, than, than being willing to, to actually do tests and, and us helping them with that. But it's, yeah, again, it's, it's, it sounds like yeah, what, what Tim said, and you, you also mentioned this, it, it sounds like everybody's doing incrementality tests and everybody else has FOMO uh, of being the last one doing it. But it's, it's uh, and sometimes we have clients that, you know, with delight come back to us in the quarterly business review and say, yeah, we are planning to invest much more in incrementality testing. And then we say, okay, how many tests are you planning to do per month? Well, we're going to start with one for the next six months. <laughs> and, you know, it's a, a, that's kind of, um, yeah, kind of what we see, see a lot. So it's difficult. We haven't really cracked that nut yet. And it's, it's, I think it's, a, I also hope it's not a German thing that, you know, German, because with our solution, we very much uh, currently at least still focus on the German market. Uh, that Germans might be more careful about testing out stuff, more you know, sort of engineering driven. But um, mm -hmm. I think it's it's a, yeah, it's a tough one. I don't know if yeah. there's anything to add, but um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So sometimes they get interested just because they you know they don't want to believe a certain channel's estimate from the marketing model, or they are actually they do want to believe it, but it sounds very good or very bad, whatever. Too, too uh, good, almost. But it's often operational issues then that um, that actually you know prevent them from doing that. And mm -hmm. The gap between interest and actually doing it is massive, I would say. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah, I I, I recognize that, and I think like my takeaway maybe for uh, whoever is listening, it's also you know start with something. And my non-technical recommendation is start with something that the business cares about and that it's mm -hmm. likely to give results. So don't overcomplicate uh, uh, the first test. You know, like let's do something that's uh, uh, relatively straightforward where the answer is gonna have a direct impact. Because the, yeah, like the, the first test matters. If we fail the first test with, we have no conclusive answer, it's much harder to get going with further tests. So yes. yeah, I guess yeah. that one takeaway on yeah that. awesome awesome recommendation um yeah i think that makes a, yeah, a lot of sense um 
Great, we are already over time, so we're only planning 30 minutes for these shows. I keep on repeating that almost in every episode, but it was such a pleasure to talk to you. And also, I have to apologize because I completely butchered and got your title wrong. It's Media Effective Measurement Specialist and uh, not what I, I think I said, Marketing Measurement uh, Specialist or something like that. Something similar. Yeah, to be something honest, very similar. Yeah, yeah it's... it's uh, um... I get creative, uh, uh, creative interpretations on the title, but everything <laughs> is more or less the same. So it's okay. Great. Yeah, it was really great to have you on the show, and uh, maybe we do a sort of follow up in uh, I don't know three or six months time to talk further about you know how the market has changed. It was really great to have you here, and um, love to learn more about how this all evolves. Um, for everyone else uh, who was listening to that, uh, please make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel, to our Spotify podcast. And um, thanks again for being here, Anna. And Tim, of course, as well. Nice. Yeah, really great to be here and uh, indeed happy to come back at a later time. Maybe we can talk about a specific example. That'd be really nice. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. Cool. Bye, Anna. Thank okay. you. Bye-bye.